Romans chapter 12. Let's read verses 1 and 2, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, reading. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, an acceptable and perfect will of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Now let us all turn to God in prayer. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us in your house to study your word once again. We do seek your cleansing and washing thoroughly in the blood of our Saviour. Lord, as far as the east is from the west, remove thou our sins from us, that this night of gathering may receive your blessing. And Father, we do pray that you will send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher, open our eyes of understanding. Lord, that both young and old in understanding may be built up in convictions, in the faith, and especially to be aware of how to seek your will. And tonight, to realize what are the hindrances to seeking your will. So, Father, we pray that you answer this prayer because um, it is needed to strengthen thy people to live in this world and not walk into your chastitive will and become useless for you. And Father, we do ask that you focus our hearts and our minds and, Lord, take our minds away from any concerns or worries and as we trust in you to protect thy people, even as we have learned, Lord, thou art the one who can protect, thou art the one who is in control of every heart. So, Lord, grant to us concentration. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, tonight, we continue in part three. Now, specifically, we are going to look at the hindrances, the hindrances to knowing God's will. We've studied about, well, what does it mean when we say God's will in the Bible? All right, the sevenfold will of God. Well, we've studied, well, what are the principles to apply in finding God's will? We studied that as well, from your daily lives to, um, to major decisions in life. And one of the key things that we must remember is the Christian must not think finding God's will is only in the major big milestones in life, all right? That is a typical thinking of most Christians. Like I shared when um, I, I encouraged the seniors to attend, well, the look in their faces are like, there's nothing for me to seek God's will, you know? I've, all my major milestones are over already. What is there, right? We have this misconception Right? Finding God's will and doing God's will is part of everyday life, from the smallest decisions to the major milestones in life. All right? And we must apply those principles. Now, one of the things that we, in order to study the hindrances, now we come to the hindrances. What are the hindrances? What prevents me from really finding God's will in my life? All right? Now, we saw this picture last week. Do not forget that when you say, I want to find God's will, well, we say we need to apply preceptive will of God. In other words, all the known commandments in the Bible, they are God's will. Please remember that and let that be ingrained deeply in your heart. Because that is often one of the hindrance, all right, which we'll cover soon. Every commandment in God's will is His known will, called the preceptive will, known to you, known to you. Now, but one of the danger is we just take one will, one will, and we say, well, um, all right, God's commandment is this, and we ignore the other aspects of God's, perspective, God's preceptive will in that situation. So here is one of the hindrance. Now, look up here at this diagram. For example, just a quick example. Um, if we take, like, um, well, keeping obligations, well, we know we are supposed to, Christians are to keep our words. Um, or rather, Christians should, um, we should know what our obligations are to human beings as well. For example, honoring authorities at the bottom. So he said, well, it is God's principle, God's known commandment. It is in the fifth commandment, for example, to honor father and mother, all right? So we said, that's the preceptive will. Now, we cannot just take one and say, well, then therefore, um, whatever they ask me to do, whenever they ask me to go back, I must obey because I must honour them. We must not forget there are also other aspects of the 
preceptive will of God, which, for example, is seek ye first the kingdom of God, the kingdom's work. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So there is also that part. So sometimes, yes, we, as we seek to honour father and mother, we also must remember, well, if it means that then I do not serve God or I give up some ministry in order to do that, then you know you're not seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All right? God's precepts, they do not contradict each other. That is the thing you must remember. Don't say, well, then it's contradicting. No, there is always resolution on how you honour father and mother in comparison to seek first the kingdom of God. All right? So this is just one example um, that, that if we are not careful, this is a big hindrance to us finding the word of God, uh, finding the will of God. Now, because you and I are going to pick, we are going to pick one of the arrows and say, God's word says this, right? Now, God's word says that, well, I must bear a good testimony, I must not stumble others, correct? So, then I should make sure that, well, I, I spend this amount of time um, with, with loved ones so that I don't stumble others. But what about other things, right? There are also God's commandments. Well, stewardship of your time. What about fellowship, study of the word? You can't let those be lower priority. Parents say, well, come back, come back to, come back to the country, all right? Come back to, to Malaysia, where, Singapore, wherever. All right, come back now. I want you to come back now. Well, then if it affects certain ministries' work, can you rearrange the timing, all right? Is it a good to have? Or is it a must-have? What is the situation? So Christian must not pick one. And because that is the thing that you want to do, then you say, well, then I drop other areas. All right? So this is one of the hindrances that we need to be careful of. Now, then, now another thing is this. Finding God's will, secondary means, not primary. What do I mean by that? Well, circumstances and providence. Last week, we studied the Bible verses, many of them, open and closed doors in the Bible are simply circumstances that describe what the, what the believers were in during that time. It had nothing to do with whether it's God's will or not God's will. Simply describing what is happening around them. All right? A very difficult situation. Or smooth and wide open. Both can be or not be God's will. Right? Now, what I'm trying to say is this. When the Christian begin to take circumstances and providence and the other one peace or no peace well if i have peace in my heart then it must be god's will or i have no peace then it is not god's will again in those passages we saw times when paul was fearful but it was god's will all right he had no peace and at times when he had no peace well it was it was indeed not god's will all right these are just just circumstances and emotions that is all so the christians one of the hindrances to the Christian finding God's will is this danger. We use circumstantial surrounding um, um, occurrences um, and what we feel as, well, then I found God's will or I have not found God's will. All right? These are, well, secondary means. In other words, well, after, after, look at the second part. This can be, this can be, God showing us His will. But God's directive will or God's test, God say, well, do this or don't do this, they are always never contradicting His precepts. So if you say, well, circumstances, providence, peace or no peace, now they must always be tested against God's preceptive will. Don't let that be your primary means of settling in your heart this is god's will for me this is god's will for my family this is god's will for my child right because it can be our own heart's desire the deceptiveness of our heart or we are so faithless and therefore fearful and that's why we say well it's not god's will because i'm afraid because this looks very scary for my child so it can't be god's will all right so we must always test all these things against well, what are the known word of God? What are His commandments? Now, then we come to more hindrances, all right? Sorry about this slide. Well, more hindrances. 
Now, a list of them. We will want to run through them. Because, now, we have studied, well, what, are God, what is God's will, well, what principles to apply, but hindrances are a problem. You can know those things in your heart and your mind. But you may, in that situation, face these things. And then, well, you forget. You forget all the principles. Well, for example, so these are the lists, all right? We'll go through them um, tonight. Now, let's start with lack of God's word. Now, lack of God's word. Now, we kept saying, the Christian who said, I want to find God's will. You must know that the first principle of finding God's will is God's known commandments. God's known commandments will always guide you to His will, all right? In fact, we'll make clear His will in very many circumstances. Straight away, you already know, I should not do this, I should not go there, I should not buy this. Immediately known. Now, if preceptive will is God's word, which is the beginning point of finding God's will, then if you do not know God's word, a lack of knowledge of God's word, you will find that you are you will face great hindrances. Now, the clearer, the more you know God's word, the clearer will the path be before you. It will be very simple to you. You know, sometimes people ask you for, for help. They say, you know, I'm, I'm very confused. I, I don't know how to find God's will in this matter. And then the more mature Christians, they say, well, God says this, this, and then in his word, these are very obvious known commandments. Then the person says, oh, yeah, now it all sounds so simple. Why was I so, so confused and found it so difficult to, to grasp what to do? Very simple, because of your very, your lack of knowledge in God's Word. So Christian, you understand why God keeps saying, study to show thyself approved unto God. Study is always, the, the Word is always reminded us to be one that studies till you perspire, till you study and labor in studying till you're at the point of collapsing, like many of you when FEBC course starts, right? The point of collapsing. Now, you are actually obeying God's word. And when you study God's word, you will find that you are approved unto God because your thinking, your choices about what to do, in other words, to walk in His will, will always be pleasing to God. All right, so the Christians must remember not making sure that you, you pay attention, you study, you, you grow as much as possible in God's Word on your own through FEBC studies, through Bible studies in church. Don't say this anymore. I don't know how to find God's will. The more you know God's Word, it's a light onto your path, a lamp to your feet. God promises that, all right? So that must be clear. So parents, if you were, if you're worried about how do I know about how do I find God's will for 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 what to do in my family for my children, the first step on how to find God's will is to know God's word like it is the most important thing that your life depended on it, not like it is a true fact. If you wait and wait, by the time your children grow up to be teens and you want to figure out what to do, it's too late. Too many things have already been out of God's will. To correct that will be very painful, all right? So I ask again, why are you not at family seminars? Why families? And then you say, I do not know how to find God's will. You miss it. Many things are covered, all right? To know God's word is to know God's will. Likewise for the singles. If you have the time that is more than others, and you don't take FEBC courses, you don't study the Word of God, you are going to find, now especially if you're single, you're going to find you're, you're on your own very often, right? There's not someone at home they are constantly um, conversing with, um, calibrating your thoughts. You are in a very dangerous position if you do not know God's Word well. Now, but the problem also is this. The less you know God's Word, well, there, seem, there doesn't seem to be any path. So say, ah, there, there is no path. I do not know God's will. It's impossible to find God's will. This is too complex. I don't think I can know God's will. There don't seem to be a path. But worst of all, to some, there is a path. There is a path. There is this, this way to walk. This must be God's will. But the Bible says this, Proverbs 14.12. Shall we read Proverbs 14.12 together? 
There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now here God says, when you do not know God's word, you will look at things. Well, this seems to be the right will. This seems to be the right thing to do. But God says, well, it seems, yes, it looks like it's God's will. And you even argue with people, this must be God's will. What, what else? But God says, the ways, the, at the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, is it not true in many singles' life, in many married people's life, in many families' life, in many elderly's life? They were so convinced this is God's will. But at the end of the day, it was actually something that led them to make decisions that they will regret for their lives and there will be so much consequences for the rest of their lives. Isn't it true? Now, so this is God's way. We know. If you know God's word well, I just want to have an animation to make us really think. All right, I hope this picture stays in your mind. When you do not know God's word, you are going all over the place. You are confused, going round in circles, going all sorts of directions. And finally, out of the picture, just part of you in the picture, right? Now, that is one of the greatest hindrances. I want to start here. Knowing God's will is nothing so mysterious and complex. If God says everything that we need for godly living, everything that you need in this life, God used Peter to tell us, it's all in here, it's all given to us. Then God is telling you, finding my will is very easy. You just need to focus on studying the word. Focus on studying the word. It's like someone walking in the dark and kept saying, I, I don't know where to go, I don't know where to go. And then the torchlight is there, but refuses to use it, right? Now, now the torchlight is there, but refuse to use it. This is the second hindrance, superficial application of God's word. When arriving at a decision or choice, there are two situations that we can end up in. Number one, hastiness. Hastiness. Well, in a rush. Don't find out the facts, the various facets of the situation, about the decision at hand, and just look at it. Ah, let's do this, all right? Now, heads of the home, you have to be very careful. Hastiness. It's one of the problem. Now, the other one is, you have already decided in your heart. Now, that is the other hindrance. Many of us, we say, I want to find God's will. But actually, deep in our hearts, we have already decided on something that we want to do. But we will have to say the standard thing. I want to know God's will. But actually, you don't want to or unwilling or unwilling to apply the whole counsel of God's word. And that is what I said in the beginning. You made up your mind about something. And then you, will, you can always take God's word to justify it. But you will never succeed if you take other precepts and honestly put it into that situation you're in. You will find that, well, once you bring in the whole counsel of God's word, it will expose your heart. You have already decided you're going to do this and you keep quoting God's word to people. All right? So be careful. This is a dangerous, um, dangerous hindrance. So we can jump into decisions because we want it. Use a portion of God's word to justify it, all right? And ignore the other parts that teach otherwise. So please don't think that just because you have God's word, you are definitely doing God's will, all right? Be honest. Now, next one. Ignoring other precepts. I've already said this. Um, now, the last point. Now, be honest. Honestly consider other precepts. All right, that may be affected while obeying a precept in my situation. You need to be very, very honest, which we'll cover further. Now, next area, next problem. Now, self-will. Ah, self-will. You can know God's word. You can know the principles. But actually, at the end of the day, you know all that. You don't even know what to apply. But self-will, self-will, sorry. Self-will takes over. Now, we ourselves can be the biggest hindrance. Your biggest hindrance to knowing God's Word. Besides not knowing the Word, you can know the Word, but you can still face a very big hindrance. Self-will, self-will. Remember with this verse last week, God says, if any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. You will know the doctrines of God very clearly. You won't be confused whether it be God or whether I speak of myself. You see the people back then, 
They, some of them, they just keep feeling, no, we are very honest. Christ, why don't you tell us honestly? We are very honest with you. And Christ has to rebuke them. You've already decided in your heart not to accept me as the Christ. And on the other hand, you deceive yourself into saying, you just need to tell us honestly, are you the Christ or not? We really want to know the truth. Ah, that is what we are. They remain blind. All right? Now, next one. Now, self-will. Um, why is this? Next. Now, God's will versus self-will. Honest seeking of God's will to obey, that is the paramount. What do I mean by that? Many of us say we want to know God's will, but we are not honestly wanting to do God's will even if God shows it to us. All right? Now, what does Christ say? Whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. That is the second bullet. Obedience in walking in preceptive will leads to a clearer way to God's directive will. Now, if your heart really wants to obey God, willing to obey God, now God says that when you keep His commandments, do those things that are pleasing to Him, you will always receive what you desire of Him because your will will always be aligned to His will. Understand that. Therefore, obedience in walking in preceptive will. Now, when you keep honestly saying, God, whatever will you show to me, whatever I know now, I will obey it very um, strictly. I will be very honest to obey it. Now the directive will will be clear. Remember what's directive will? Preceptive will is very clear commandments, all right? General, apply to everybody, apply in every situation. Now, then directive will, it becomes, God will direct you more specifically to your situation. But God uses His Word today, all right? So, I've, I've quoted this many times, all right? My, one of my main um, resistance to coming to BPCWA, I know I was called into full-time ministry, but my resistance was deep in my heart, unwilling to leave my ailing father in his last days in Singapore and come over. Now, everybody reads, if any man love father and mother more than me, he's not worthy of me. Everybody reads that, all right? But God used that to direct me very clearly and rebuke me very clearly. Directive will. But directive will will only be clear to you. And I want you to, hope you understand this clearly. Directive will, which we often say, well, God hasn't spoken, God hasn't spoken. Directive will is only getting, it will only get clearer if you are constantly very obedient to his preceptive will. That is how it works. That is why God says, if anyone is willing to do my will, you will know. You will know the doctrine. You will understand the directive will. You will see it. This is a critical point that you and I must remember. It's a very great hindrance to us. All right? A very great hindrance. Now, remember we said last week, how do I know if I'm going to be single for life? What's the answer? You do not know. All right? You do not know yet. And then you may not know. And to some, at a certain point, they know. It can be known. But for those who are not sure at that point, what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? Just keep walking clearly in His preceptive will. Everything that God tells you, whether it's related or not related to um, um, getting married, you just keep obeying, then the directive will, will become clearer and clearer. All right? So, in the meantime, just obey. Whether it's about marriage, whether it's about finding a job, whatever it is. I still haven't found a job. I do not know what is God's will. In the meantime, just keep doing whatever God asks you to do. Study the Word. Study the Word. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Serve. Serve. All right? Be charitable. Be charitable. Just keep following every commandment and then the directive will, will become clearer and clearer. All right? So that is crucial for you to remember. Now, self-will. Remember, God says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, this is one of the things that 
when we, having known God's word, refuse to obey, we grieve the Holy Spirit. When we grieve the Holy Spirit, guess what will happen? Well, the Spirit will not always strive with men. Right? Over time, over time, He may leave you alone to your, to your destruction. Right? That is what will happen. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. That is a hindrance, all right? That's a hindrance. This is another problem of finding God's will. We want to find God's will, but in our hearts, we are afraid of difficulties, and we don't want to accept difficulties. Now, look at Paul's life. Look at Paul's life. Now, he said, Now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. Paul was intent to go to Jerusalem, but he said, I do not know what will befall me there, except this one thing the Holy Ghost told me. He witnessed to me that bonds and afflictions abide me, that wherever I go there, only bonds means imprisonments, all right? Trouble, afflictions, pain, even physical pain. That is what is going to be with him. But notice how when Paul knew God's word. Now, notice this verse in 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Why? That I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord. Now, this was his calling, all right? He wanted to finish his calling on earth and do what God willed for him. And he says, then none of these things move me. You know what is why Paul always knows God's will? Very simple. This is the secret of his life. He always knows God's will because that is him. I, I won't let anything anything that, is, that may cause me to fear detract me from finishing God's will on earth. Now, Christian, only when you and I reach that stage, then we will say that I will finish my course with joy. With joy. The God's will will always be joyful to you when you don't count your life dear unto yourself. All right? So please do, do um, take this to heart. Be honest. You face something, you know it's God's will, you know the, the, the instructions, the commandments are clear, but you, you think that if I make this decision, the financial cost to me as a single or, or even as a family, the, the um, difficulties that I will face in life or even elderly, the problems that I will face at my age with my family, for example, with my children. Now, these are things that will cause us to then say, ah, I just don't want to think about God's will. I just don't want to think about it. I just ignore it. See, it's very dangerous to let fear be a hindrance. Now, next one. All right? Now, finding God's will involves dying to self. All right? Continuing in that. Your dreams, your ambitions, your aspirations, your affections, all these things must die. Again, the Apostle Paul's life motto, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live, what is it? The life which I now live means he is doing God's will. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, finding God's will, you must die to self. And you must apply faith. In order to die to self, the hindrance to dying to self is Faithlessness, fear, fear, that is what it is. Now, Christian, you and I will only know the joy of doing God's will. When you begin to just obey and do what He commands, you will find that God will take care of things. Like the Apostle Paul, he said, I'm going there, but I do not know what is going to happen. All I know is trouble is, is waiting for me. But when he went there, you read even though in his prison, uh, prison epistles, he was in prison, but he was full of joy. Full of joy. When you make that decision, you may face difficulties, but when you see God intervenes at the last minute and help and this and that, and, you're, and you begin to do his will, you will know the joy. All right, finding God's will is about dying to self. Prerequisite, don't die to self. 
You will find that you're very muddled in your family life, in your singlehood, in your student life. Now, self-will, continue. Now, will you still do God's will when He has made it known to you? What if it's not your will? You want to find God's will? Student, you say, well, I want to know what God's will is. What cause to choose to study? And then as you read God's word, as you, as you, as God brings messages, sermons, you begin to realize that I think that is my self-will, my pride, my lust. That is why I want to be in this industry or whatever it is. Now, studying legitimate courses are all not sinful, but you will know in your heart. And when you say, God, please show me, I'm going to enter a course. I want to choose a course. Can you please make it clear to me? I don't want to end up wasting my life. And when God does lead you to that and show you, what are you going to say? Now, it's not my will for sure to come to Australia. Definitely not my will. I do not desire to come here. But when God show me His will, I can pretend and I can lie to everyone. I say, no, no, it's not God's will for me to be in Australia. I can serve in Singapore churches. No one would know. Everyone would say, yeah, yeah, good. No, nothing. The wiser to anyone. When God shows you His will, will you do it? And that is the challenge. Now, what if you prefer another option rather than God's revealed will? The other option is not sinful as well. I prefer that. And when God makes His directive will clear to you, what's going to happen? Now, I'm not saying that everything that God shows you will be against your desire. All right? But the Bible does tell us if you do things that are pleasing to Him, well, your will and God's will will align. Now, what if someone disagrees with God's will for you? What if someone disagrees with God's will for you? For example, you know in the Word of God, very clear, preceptive will, you must obey God. Maybe in biblical separation, right? Maybe even among your relatives, biblical separation. And someone disagrees with you, a loved one especially, especially, or your close friend. What will take over? You see, the hindrances of, of the self in this area are very real. So in the midst of you keep saying, I want to find God's will, I want to find God's will, you must be very cognizant, very aware as a teen, as an adult, as an adult, very aware these are the problems that will always be plaguing my heart. Well, ascertaining God's will includes self-examination. Please know that. Now, just because something is desirable for a Christian does not necessarily mean it's God's will for every individual. For example, certain areas of service in church, ministries, work, at the work your job, or school subjects, or school um, what you choose to study and to work in in your career. Now, just because it is not sinful, not evil, just because other Christians, that is God's will for them, now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's for you. You have to examine your, yourself. So don't keep thinking, finding God's will, I just keep looking at Bible verses and all that and all that. Yeah, all these meets, right? Yeah, all these meets. So it must be God's will for me to get married because all these are clear. And this is what I want. But when you look at your own life, you can hardly take care of yourself. You, keep, you grow up and your life is in a mess. You can't make sensible decisions. All right? You're, you can't even take care of yourself um, properly, um, physically, emotionally. You have to examine yourself. It looks like I don't think I can take care of another person. And another person with and with children in the family. I don't think, yeah, as much as I want, as much as it is so for other people's life, as much as it's not sinful in the Word of God. Now, you must examine yourself. Is that for me? Same for them serving in church. Many people want to serve in many areas. I want to be a Sunday school teacher, but cannot teach, right? Cannot engage children, right? Um, you know that you do not have the gift. You must be honest if God has given you the gift. Someone says, I want to be a pastor, all right? It's nothing evil, but cannot preach, cannot teach, all right? Cannot administer, cannot um, 
um, take care of, of ruling the church. Don't have such skills. Always cannot make decisions properly, a mess at work, and so on, right? So part of finding God's will, I'm just saying part of finding God's will is also examining ourselves. Do I have what it takes? If I don't, how can I say it is God's will, right? Now, next. Hindrances, materialism, materialism, one of the big problems. Now, I'm not saying in this passage, I'm not even saying that you and I, we are looking for um, super luxurious things. Now, first and foremost, we know the Lord says, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. Are you ready to be like that? I'm not saying God is calling us to be all like that. But what I'm saying is, when Christ said, my meat is to do, 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 do the Father's will, now, it is to the point where He is God. But God's Father's will, God the Father's will for Him on earth is that, yeah, He's not going to own properties, all right? He's not going to be rich. He will struggle when He moves from places to places. Even ask people, can you please go ask the person to let us have a room? Now, unless we are at that stage, we will find materialism to be a hindrance. It is, it is good that Christ did it for us, Christ suffered for us. Well, but if, it is, if I have to do it for God, what God chooses for me as my will, well, it's not good. I don't want to be materially um, disadvantaged. Now, I want to emphasize again, I'm not saying you be a Christian, all of us must be poor, all right? But what I'm saying is, this is often a big hindrance, right? Um, I have this verse, yes. Now, this man, he wants to know God's will. He wants to know how to be saved. He wants to know God's will. But, well, what did Jesus say? And Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Possessions is what hinders us. We can kneel before God like this young man. Literally kneel before God. Say, God, show me your will. I know you are God. Please show me your will. But material things can be our biggest hindrance. Now, back here. Now, I'm not talking about even design super, super luxurious life. I'm not even talking about that. All right? It may not be even that. Just basic physical material things in life. Well, if, if I live in obedience to God, well, maybe God calls you to full-time one day. Well, then I cannot have, I cannot have this, cannot have... And you, you may not be thinking of super expensive things. Just basic things in life. You find that, well, it's probably something that I, I, I won't have in life. Or whatever it is in your decision, in your family, the same. Other families will have these things, but yes, we won't have it. If we were to obey God in this matter or another matter, likewise for the single, right? So I'm not talking about even super luxurious things. It can be just material things, material things. Now then we have this. Cultural norms and tradition is another hindrance. In other words, we are so used to what we culturally are taught before we were saved, like these people. Well, he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own traditions, making the word of God none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Now, I said, I think in the first session, we are all, majority of us, um, are Chinese, right? We are very strong traditions and culture um, um, in terms of how we think about family, about singlehood, about marriage, about, um, about money. We have many preconceived ideas, just like different people from another culture will have, all right? Different um, emphasis on different things. A Christian, be very careful. Even the Christians or the people back then, they had this problem. And for them, some of them, to the point where they will not turn to Christ as their saviour. That is how strong 
Some of them took the Jewish culture, right? Now, some events in our Christian life, uh, some events in our Chinese culture, or if you're um, um, from another race, in your culture, now they can continue to be very major hindrance to us in obeying and doing God's will. You must examine them very carefully. Now, what if, what if, right, during a period where is, well, culturally we should and typically we would, all right, spend time with family. Now, what if during that time your ministry work or during that time there is some church activities which, which will help you, all right, or help your child? Now, how are you going to choose? Are you going to say, this is so important that I'm going to forego these things. You know, sometimes I, I always wonder, now, now what if um, I say, well, you know, um, Chinese New Year, every Chinese New Year, a pastor will go home, all right? Because it's very important, right? In our culture, we should, we should have the family reunion, dinner, and all those things. But if at that time, it's also a period where it's very crucial for the church and for feeding, right? Certain things. And say, well, no, no, please, please remember, this is my culture. How would you think? Say, well, this pastor, I don't think he is very committed to the work of God, right? You would think like that. But we seldom apply that to ourselves. It only applies to full-time workers. When we find God's will, it applies to full-time workers. This kind of thing. No, you must put God first. But in our own lives, we don't apply to ourselves, right? We still hold on to the culture. See, culture can be a very strong hindrance. I'm not saying culture or everything in our culture is evil. I'm saying even the non-evil things can become a hindrance to you. Now, next. Lethargy, inaction, right? This is a classic one. Hindrance of, actually, just don't think about it. Don't, you know, like ostrich, hit hide your head in the, in the ground and just think that everything will go away and you're safe. When you're walking further and further away from God's will, you just think that don't do anything, well, it's fine. All right? Lethargy and inaction. Obedience is an act of turning away from the path of disobedience, turning away from self-will. You want to find God's will. You want to do God's will in your personal life, in your family life. You cannot be lethargic because to do God's will is to actively turn away from your own will. And sometimes it is painful. Sometimes it is costly. Sometimes it takes a lot of change in your life and those changes may be permanent. A lethargic person will, in, will more often than not not find God's will because finding, doing God's will is going to be difficult. Look at the Apostle Paul's life. Now even the Lord says, there, and the Lord give you bread of adversity and water affliction. He said, yes, there will be difficulties in your life, but he promised, yet shall not my teacher, thy teachers be removed. So he said, I will continue to teach you. You will continue to have the word to guide you. And thine ears shall hear the word behind thee, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. So God says, I will keep guiding you. Now, when God guides you, you have to walk in it. You have to know it. You have to study it. You have to follow it. You cannot just, maybe the best way to put it is, you want to find God's will and you just let your life be swept along. Swept along by the time of tide. Swept along by whatever's happening around you and see whatever comes. Then we decide you, you will not find God's will. You will most often than not, than not be swept into the will of the world, all right? So you cannot be lethargic and inactive. We tend to choose the easier path that doesn't offend another, another loved one. Well, I quoted this verse earlier on. See, this is one of the hindrance. Just don't think about it, especially when someone else is going to be unhappy. My husband will be unhappy. My wife will be unhappy. My parents, my children will be unhappy when I choose to do God's will. Well, what will happen? Um, you will choose the other path. My parents say, well, don't be part of such an extreme church. What biblical separation? You know, come with us. What is going to happen? 
You see, when you want to find God's will, I will put it this way, the test will come. I want to say that again. Even in the Old Testament, the people say, well, we want to do God's will, we want to do God's will. God put them through tests. Tests will come. And whenever you face those tests, you must remember, I said I wanted to find God's will and I wanted to do God's will. Now the test is here. What am I going to choose? My will, someone else's will, because of fear, what will it be? What will it be? Now, if God's will is always done, so maybe I ask you this question at this point. Well, if God's will is always done, then why bother, right? Decretive will, and we know that all things work together, all right? If God's will will always be done, then I can do my own will and all will still work out, right? So why go through the pain, avoiding this and that and walking close to God and studying the Word? Somehow, somehow, right? Everything will still work out because God's will is always done in the end. Maybe I ask, how to answer that? Alex, your child said, Daddy, we learn decretive will. Everything will turn out as God wants it to be. All right, God gave you the privilege to serve Him. He said, it's okay, I can forego that privilege. The main thing is everything will still work out, right? Thomas, All right, you can walk into God's chastity field. Say more. Okay, we, have, we always have a choice. So that's the thing. No, you know, when it comes to God's will, you have a choice. You can choose to do your own will. And this is exactly what it is. I choose to my, do my own will, but because we learn God's will will always be done. Somehow my family will turn out right because at the end God says His will will always be done, right? And my, as a single, my life will turn out. I can choose how I want to live now. In the end, my life will turn out as according to God's will. And so on. Now, we should not be callous with our decisions simply because God's sovereignty works all things out well. Because God says this. Let's read Matthew 18, 7 together, reading. Woe unto the world because of offences, for it must needs be that offences come. But woe unto that man by whom offences come. Yes, my will will be done. Christ will be crucified. But then, it's, then, the, then you can say, well, well, well then, as well, then whatever I do doesn't matter, right? My salvation will still be worked out. But God says, he says, woe unto the man by whom the offences come. Yes, God's will will be worked out, but it's woe to you, right? Like one of you say, I will walk into his chastative will. Please remember this. God's will will always be done, not yours. Not yours. God's will will always be done. But what you will end up in is God's chastitive will. Don't think that all things will work out. God said very clearly, blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. All right? So His will will be done in your life. But that will is called a cursed life. That is what it is. All right? So don't be so foolish to think everything will work out. No, your family will not be what it was meant to be. Your personal life will not be what it's meant to be. You are in God's cursed will, all right? So don't be foolish to think everything will work out um, in your life. No, not in your life. God's plan will always work out for God's work. Now, next. Following Christ is always about taking up the cross. You say, I want to follow Jesus. What you're saying is, I want to take up my cross and do His will. That is what it is, all right? I've said that many times already. Now, you want to do God's, you want to do God's will. Doing God's will very simply also means this. Now, let's read this together. For David, after he had served his own generation, by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Now, here, God describes David's life. David did God's will. What was doing God's will in David's life, in his people's life? Serving his own generation. Serving. Service. Service. Service is part of God's known will. So any Christian who is 
well, just think, well, I get saved, I take care of my own family, and then I have my own, um, as a single, well, I, I just live my own life, I don't commit sin. You must know that that is not doing God's will. God, doing God's will is always serving your generation. The time that you live in, the church that you're in. So any Christian who think that just be a nominal Christian, don't have to be um, um, involved in um, doing God's work. Um, and when people ask, I, I, I can turn it down. You must know that you're simply saying, God, I do not want to do your, your will. That's all. So change this thinking. Doing God's will. I want to find God's will. I want to find God's will. When you approach to serve, serve. You're doing God's will. Now, actually, now this is the last one before we move to frequently asked questions. God's will is always the best for us. Now, let's read together. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an, an expected end, to give you an expected end. Now, God says, my will for you, my thoughts towards you are always good, peace, not evil. To give you an end means your life now and, your, and through eternity, something that is good. Now, what is one of the biggest hindrance to the Christian in doing God's will? You find it, but you don't want to do it. Why? Because of unbelief that God's will is the best for us, both for now and for eternity. That is one of the very big hindrance to us embracing and doing God's will. You won't embrace God's will because you, you look at, well, well, you ask for God to show you His will, then from perceptive will, you discover, mm, God wants me to do this or not do this, then directive will makes it even clearer. But you still think, how can this be good for my child? How can this good be good for my family? How can this be good for my singlehood? How can this be good for my um, senior's age? How can it be good for my working life, my student life? How can it be? You do not trust God. That is why I say, well, I, I think maybe I partially do God's will or I, I just choose to my, do my own, goals, God, my own will because I think it's better. A distrust that when you look at the situation and the will does not suit you, you must still have this faith. God's thoughts towards me, in other words, His will is always, is always thoughts of, thoughts of peace. A good end for me. I must trust Him. Now, there, there is a slide, but I don't know where it is now. I must have accidentally now here. Now, I miss this. Self-will. One of the greatest things we need to have to avoid hindrance is honesty. Honesty. I can't emphasize this enough. God's word make it clear. Now, God says, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not fleshly wisdom, but the grace of God, we have our conversation in the world and more abundantly toward you. Paul says, how we live our lives, how we walk in God's will. Now, he uses this word, godly sincerity, not just sincerity. Godly sincerity, not fleshly wisdom. Two things, two things. Not fleshly wisdom, not what you've been brought up to think. Not what you think from your experience as a working person, as an elderly person, from life's experience. Paul said, no, we don't base, base it on fleshly wisdom. How we walk our lives. It's always, what does God's word say? We will follow his preceptive will. Godly sincerity. No pretense. No pretense. Now, Paul can pretend in many things and say, oh, God doesn't want me to go to Jerusalem because God showed me there bounds, uh, I'll be bounded there, there'll be affliction, there'll be all this trouble there. So God doesn't want me to go. You know what the church will do? The church will embrace him because that is exactly what the churches think. But Paul knew in his heart the directive will of God was clear in his heart. This is a closed door from all human fleshly wisdom it is a closed door, but he had godly sincerity. He truly believed and knew in his heart God wanted him to go. You see, that is 
When you and I are like that, it's guaranteed that God will show us His will. Guaranteed, because we are willing to do His will. Now, next one. For if not our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Christian, don't be foolish. God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. We can fool our parents. We can fool our spouse. We can fool um, our children. We can fool our close Christian friends and go and do something and choose something in life, whether it's studies, whether it's a job. We can fool them, but you cannot fool God. The end of your life will all be burnt up, everything that you do. Now, remember the drawing I did in the beginning? Eternity, bima seat judgment, and then God's will, the sevenfold will leading you. It will eventually, you know, how you live out God's will in this life, honestly, is going to determine what will be exposed at the bima seat judgment. Well, even before that, God already knows. God already knows. Now, let us then now move to the frequently asked questions. All right, so we studied the hindrances. Now, first question. I think there are six, all right? Now, is it, well, just answering six. By the way, the others I will answer at, now I found the, I found the topic to Adelphos Adelphi, right? I'm going to continue doing FAQ on finding God's will. And I reserve the boy-girl relationship ones, all right? All those to Adelphos Adelphi. Now I want to answer more generic ones, which I think is important for, for everyone, generic audience. Now, this is a very interesting question that um, a teen submitted. Is it okay to ask God for confirmations, like clear signs, all right, um, in order to do something that is not very obvious to us? You understand the question, right? I don't know what to do, and it's not very obvious. Maybe both are not sinful. So can I ask God, God, can you show me a sign? Which one to choose, all right? So this is the question. And it's asked for confirmation. God, this one, right? Maybe this one. Can you confirm? Now, here we have the account, which is very commonly used by Christians to justify, and sadly some even to teach, you to ask God for confirming, confirming, confirming signs. All right, so you say, the Bible has this. So as a parent, you say, well, I do not know what to do. Let's follow Gideon, all right? And, and so on. Now let's read, well, let's read together. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, Behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou said, as I said. And it was so, for he rose up early in the morning and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let thine anger, let not thine anger be hot against me. And I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once, with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. So you see here, now how about that? Parents say, not sure what to do, all right? All right, let's take a diaper. <laughs> let's take a diaper, all right? And then the, the baby wee wee's in the diaper, all right? And where's the first one? Um, the dew be on the fleece only. All right, so only the diaper will be wet. The bed will be dry, all right? Then it happened. Then tomorrow night, okay, tomorrow night, let's, the baby sleep through the night. Then um, the bed is wet. The diaper is dry. <laughs> yeah, so now... Jokes aside, but this is actually very common for us. God, you're going to school. God, I'm not sure which one to choose. God, can you show me a sign which course to choose? All right? And then say, well, if when I reach school, when I reach school, if my science teacher is the first one that I see, all right, then I will choose a science course for university. But if I see my Arts, if there's such a thing. I'm a literature teacher. It's the first person I see. Uh, there is a confirming sign. Because God, I like both. I like both. All right? If I see literature teacher, I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'll major in literature. All right? God, can you please confirm for me? 
right? Don't, don't say that we don't do that. Or maybe parents, right? Maybe parents. Well, or maybe singles. Well, God, do you want to get me to get married, right? If I come to church this Sunday and then brother so-and-so wears, wears um, 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 blue color shirt and then he talks to me, right? Then it's a confirming sign that you want me to get married, it can be the other way. The brother say about the sister. Now, we have all these kind of ideas which we sometimes feel that, wow, Lord, I really do not know how. So God, can you show me confirming signs? Now, let us study this passage carefully and ask ourselves, is this what God is teaching us? Ask me for confirming signs. Now, first and foremost, confirmation of earlier clear revelation of his will. Gideon was asking not for a confirmation of something that he do not know about, that he is not clear, not so obvious about. Look at the blue words. Gideon said, As thou hast said, as you have said, save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And he said it twice, that thou will save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. So, in the first place, this passage is not ask, teaching us to go and ask God, God, I don't know, please show me. It is not. God's will is already known. Now, I just established the principle first, all right? Now, the second thing that we must realize about this passage is, now, what didn't ask was clear impossibility of something happening. Nothing short of a miracle. That was the kind of confirmation sign he was asking for. Now, firstly, the dew on the fleece only the dry on the earth on off dry. So you imagine through the night you get up and then ground bone dry, pick up the bunch of fleas, squeeze it a whole bottle of a whole bowl of water. What is the possibility? Impossible. Impossible. To make it even more difficult, more impossible. This time the opposite. Right? The ground everywhere is wet, but the lump of fleas will be dry. That is more difficult because fleas, by its nature, will attract, will attract and get itself, attract water and get itself soaked. So, so Gideon knows these things. So now he's asking for even a more impossible thing to happen. Now, a few things to learn. Confirmation request was not anything common or generally possible. It is not like well, God, if he calls me today, this is a very common thing. People call, people make telephone calls, all right? Or if he comes through the door soon, people do walk through the door, all right? It's not uncommon. If I see an advertisement, oh, God, should I buy this? Well, if, if well, I, I receive an email in my inbox as an advertisement for this product, then it is, I think it's, then you're confirming your will. If the teacher calls my name when I go to school, then, then well, it's your, it's your will for me to study this course and that. Or if the person agrees to my request, okay, God, I pray, right? How, what is the sign? If I ask this person and the person say yes, then it is open door and it's your, your will. We're going to answer that after, after as well. Now, the first thing to remember is this. If you want to ask for signs, confirming signs, you better not ask for something very, that, that would happen in daily life. Now, we know that God does not work by miracles today anymore, all right? And you want to ask God for those things, and you really mean it, all right? Well, are you willing to ask for something totally impossible? God, if it's your will for me to marry this person, all right? I can't confirm. Two brothers, all right? Which one? Both asked me to marry this person, all right? The brother that walked through the doors without the doors opening. That will be the one. Have you asked that? All right? And both brothers did not walk through the door with the door opening. Are you willing to say then, God, it is meant for me to be single? You see, it's this kind of situation. Please understand how serious it is. Now, furthermore, this was not God, who am I going to marry? God, what course am I going to take? God, what should I buy? these two products, go, what school should I send my child to? Now, this is what? This is thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people's lives 
at stake, the lives of the children of Israel at stake when they go to war. Gideon knew that. And if they die because of Gideon, now, Gideon's um, um, failure to be sure, then, then what will happen? Their families will suffer. They will have no fathers. The children will grow up without fathers. You know how the burden that he's carrying, he's not talking about marriage or, or, um, or um, what to do with their children's life. He's not talking. This is something that is, that is of humongous implication and significance. That is why he did that, right? Now, many things in life, well, of course, not marriage. Huh? Many things in life, we, we can... We can make a wrong decision and, and another decision. Now, I'm not saying that just because that's the case, then we don't find God's will. But we have to know the context. Now, the other thing is this. Is it okay to, for, to ask God for... Uh, sorry. Now, asking for confirmation signs again and again does not necessarily please God. Now, this passage is not encouraging us to ask for confirmation sign because God has made His will clear. When God has made His will clear, this is a very unique and very um, significant situation. Now, look at this. Look at this. Look at the second time. Let not thine anger be hot against me. In verse 39. Let not thine anger be hot against me. Now, Gideon knew that this was not pleasing to God. That is why he said this. The first time he did it, in his heart, he already knew, I should just take God's word as thou hast said. All right? But so many people's lives are at stake and families at stake. Now, God may be more gracious and understanding. And the second time he asked, he knew that he would make God angry. And he prayed that, please don't get angry at me. Now, this way of doing things is not necessarily pleasing to God. If God has shown you in his preceptive will, if God has shown you through his directive will, all right, go with it. Go with it by faith. Don't keep asking for signs. Now, this was an exceptional situation, as I've mentioned. Now, do not test God's patience because we are lazy. That's the thing. Not willing to obey or hoping that God will change his mind. You are lazy. Most of the people want this sign. All right? You may be unconscious of it, but you must wake up to the fact, am I being lazy? Am I not seeking to find answers that God says, my word is a lamp unto your feet, light unto your path. Am I lazy to go and find all the verses about this thing, meditate on that, honestly apply the principles to this situation? For example, studying what cause to study. After checking, well, it's not sinful, then you, study, then you say, well, I think it's pride. I think it's pride. You already, you take your time to sit down and meditate and think. I think it's lust. Because, well, people say that in this line, you'll make a lot of money. Right? But you don't want to find God's way. You don't want to think. You don't want to, to follow. And then you just say, well, God, show me, show me confirming sign. Now, applying God's word is the normative way that God works with us. Please remember that. That's the normal way. God uses his word today, especially. Now, next one. Are, are you truly going to obey when God shows you? Because even if you were to ask God, well, show you. And the opposite happens. Are you really going to obey? Most of us are like that. God showed me, then it didn't happen. Or maybe I didn't ask clearly. Or maybe by chance. Or we just ignore it because it didn't happen to what we want. Now, but you need to ask, has God already not shown you, shown you, right, by his preceptive will? And, or you are just fearful and unwilling to obey. That is why you're asking for confirmation signs. Gideon was not asking because of that. So ultimately, what to do? What if I really don't know and really want to know? Don't be lazy. Pray, think, search, apply the word, seek godly counsel. All these are active things you need to do. Differentiate between fear, insubmission, and not knowing. Someone say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, is because insubmission. Do not refuse to submit to known will by asking for confirmation. Now what will happen is this. Like Balaam, 
God kept telling him, this is my will. And he kept going back to ask. Queen kept going to ask. And finally, he was sent to his death. Sent to his, or rather sent to his um, um, destruction eventually. So when God has made his preceptive will known, do not keep still asking God. God, can you confirm? Can you confirm? Can you confirm? All right? You may not hear from God. Now, it is better to have the word that you can cling to than variable feelings and circumstances. Don't go with circumstances first. Have the preceptive will and the directive will from the word of God and cling to it. Because Peter himself told the people before he died, you have a more sure word of prophecy where unto you do well that you take heed to and let it shine your path in this world of darkness. Before he died, he said, I'm going to die soon. I have met Christ. I've heard Christ in person. But you have something better than me. The word. The word. Use it. Use it in this world. That is the best thing. Now, for example, when God called me here, right, I'm just using... My, my own personal life. Um, you can have your own, ex you may have your own experience. Now, there's one thing that was very clear in my mind, um, having known sevenfold will and all that, not as well as now, but one thing was clear in my mind, and I thank God that the, that's a, how he led me through his word to think. I will not ask for signs. I will not ask for confirmations. I will not. Because my constant fear is this. Now, what if I say this, 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 and it happened? Now, then when I come, and then things go all wrong, what am I going to do? Tell you, I'm sorry, I think this is not God's will for me. Now, I'll not only destroy my own ministry, I will destroy a church, you, your lives, by coming because I asked for a sign, and it seemed like it, and I come, or my feelings were this. Now, as we study God's Word, we must remember God's word is the most sure thing that when you have it, you cling on to it. That's the best. Ask God to show you his precepts. Study it. Don't be lazy. Find the principles. Apply the whole counsel of God. Be clear. Be honest. Then after that, ask God for directive will through his word. Very specific. Then it becomes clear. It is his word. That is why when everything was so difficult in the ministry, my heart was full of joy. Nothing ever changed my mind. I think maybe it was not God's will for a single second, even though other pastors tell me, maybe it's not God's will. Maybe it's God's will for you to start another church somewhere else. Now, if it is not clinging on to the sure word of God, I think there are many times I would have said, well, I think maybe it's not God's will because look, I asked God for this, then it looks like it's not. What am I going to do? Now, always use... Now, other circumstances... Now, God does and sometimes, God can and sometimes does use circumstances and providence. But do not ask for those as confirming signs. Do not depend on those as confirming signs. You can, as we studied last week, you can look back and say, well, you know, I have this word, sure word that I cling on to. Now, I look back and see how God led me providentially. I can see and it's a comfort. But even if those things did not happen, it does not matter. You want to find out God's will about your studies, about your job, about your family, whatever it is. Go by the word. Cling on to the word. God will show you. He promised to show you, right? Very often it's because we're not willing to read it, not willing to see it. We don't want to do His will. We won't know the doctrine. And for example, my PR came in record time, right? From the time of submission, I think it was three or four weeks. It's, it's incredible. I am still not going to say that is the sign. I will not say that. I say those are comforting assurances. But my calling here is not based on something spectacular like that. It's based on the word. That is it. That is what I'm trying to help us to understand. One day you make a decision for your family or for your personal life. If you base it first on circumstances, providence, and asking God to confirm, and especially confirm with things that happen normally in life. One day you're going to look back 
when things go wrong. You do not have this assurance. You do not have the assurance that God will be with you because it's He showed you clearly in His will and He used His directive word to show you. You do not have the assurance. You will always wonder, wonder, wonder. Yeah, some things may happen and look back, yes. Now, but I also want to caution. You must do your human responsibility. So it doesn't mean, well, God shows this and that, then I just come. That is human responsibility as well. I will tell the church very clearly, I will preach these things. VPP, biblical separation, are you going to stop me? I wrote it very clearly. I say, if, if you want me to come and serve, that's my human responsibility. Are you going to stop all this? I say, no, we will not. Then please publish it and put it on the notice board for three weeks for everyone to read before you say that you want me to come. Please publish this and post it on the notice board. That's what I did. That even when you find God's will, there must be also the human responsibility to ensure, all right, that we are doing things according to the preceptive will of God. That is the point. Okay, so I'm just sharing an example. Um, now, parents, singles, when you base your choices on God's word and you seek and you, and you study the whole counsel and you ask God for his directive will through his word, you, you will be unmovable. When you grow old, they say, did I make the wrong decision to be a single or to be married? You will never ask that question. Never. You know, someone said something along the line of, you, nev you will never be at rest until you find the rest in God's will, all right? Something along that line. Now, um, now this one. Do I, now, this is the one. Do I need to seek God's will even when I go to the supermarket, when I go to exercise, have dinner with my parents, or have dinner with my worshippers? Now, do I need to seek God's will? What do you think? How many of you seek God's will before you go to some supermarket, before you decide to go and exercise? Do you need to? The Bible verse is clear. I mentioned already. Whether you, therefore, you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So definitely going to the supermarket, exercising, and so on. Now, these are more than your ordinary daily things that you do all the time, all right? Now, Christ said, my meat is to do the will of, the, of him that sent me. Christ even relate his doing the will of God as common and as important as his daily eating. That is what it is. In fact, it is more important than that. Now, what does it mean? There are many principles. Before I go further in answering this question, the key point of this question in understanding this, answering this question is this, all right? So I hope you get the key point first. The key point is the Christian must come to a point in life where everything is guided by God's will. Everything. Because whether you eat or drink, do to the glory of God, and only if it is according to God's will, then you will glorify God. Everything. So you say, well, then how? Before I go to this. So before I go to the supermarket, before I go to exercise, I must kneel down, pray for one hour, look for directive view from God before I go out, before I go meet my parents for dinner. Is it this week, next week? What are the principles you should apply? Maybe I'll ask you to think. What are the principles? Um, Howard. I don't know. Supermarket. Maybe I ask ladies, all right? Super. Ladies. Uh, okay, maybe uh, Winnie. Okay. All right. So I will have to know what is God's priority for the day. All right. And then I have to make my decisions based on prioritizing what is God's will for the day. Right. So in other words, you're going to go by preceptive will. What is God's will priorities for the day? What is God's priority for Tuesday? Church prayer meeting. What is God's will? God has made it will known. Since the church was planted, Friday night, Bible studies, all right? Sunday, worship, for example. So these are known, known will, where God says, do not, don't forsake the assembling of yourself. You see, certain days are clear. 
In other words, should I go to the supermarket today? But if I went today, well, God's order of thing today, there is prayer meeting, there is Bible study. Does it mean that it will make me more frazzled? Does it make, make me more tired? Does it make me so busy that I am unable to prepare my family when they come back in time so that we all can go for prayer meeting, go for Bible study without quarreling and screaming at each other and everything going wrong? You see, we are actually, we are actually needing to make decisions even in the smallest things in life to make sure that it is according to God's preceptive will. There are two, there are three days that God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself. He has ordained it in his church. And you say, God, if that is your will, then I must make my priorities. That. Why are you not coming for certain things? Is it because always, you're always planning those things on those days? They say, look like I have not been thinking of doing God's will. I need to make those changes. All right? This is just an example. So even exercise. Do I want to exercise on Saturday night? when tomorrow is worship. What about outing, bringing my children to go, to go, to the, to, to go hiking, all right? You see, we are, we, unless we are conscious that in everything that I do, whether eat or drink, I must make sure that I will glorify God, in other words, do His will, we will just do things without thinking. So now you and I must be conscious. I, you know, I decide to go and do this today or buy this today. It may not be a sinful thing. I decide to bring my children to go hiking today. Or let's, husbands, uh, men, let's, this, let's plan for a cycling trip. Remember, I, I uh, counseled some of you at the Husband's Fellowship. Don't do it on a Saturday if you are going to go on a cycling trip that is so long that the next day you're going to be so tired you're, you're going to be aching and you're not going to be able to concentrate and, and you'll be dozing off at worship, then don't. Cycling is not evil. Fellowshipping together to go cycling is not evil. But you see, unless you are conscious, I need to find God's will in this. It is not some God show me a sign. It is not, well, I do not know where it is. You know it. It's just we don't think about it. That is the problem. Students, should I, do my, should I do this project today? Should I do this project another day? See, all these things, you just ask, how is it going to affect my quiet time? How is it going to affect my studying of FEBC? My, or what course I choose, for example? These are all known will, very clear. Husbands, when you make a decision for your family, how is this going to affect us? Going for church camp, going for holiday Bible program, all kinds of things. Will, will they be too tired? when they reach there or when, when they come back, right? That kind of things. Now, I want to emphasize again. We, in many daily life activities, it does not occur to us, I must do God's preceptive will. Many things are known already. Should I go visit my, even my, fam, my, my family, all right? Um, in Perth or whatever. There are things. How is this going to be an example to my children in the future? What, what? And, and so on, all right? So many things. In other words, that big cloud, for example. Now, next one. Must I seek God's will when planning my holidays? Same principles apply here. I plan, for example, to go back to Singapore. Does it mean that, well, I, I should visit parents? I should visit uh, my, my, my family? Just because I must. Does it mean that, well, I must, then I just go. We all must think. We all do go back to visit family. When? Which month? Why? Many of these things. Not because they say, I want you to come back at this month. Then we say, oh, okay, I should honour parents. There are many things to consider. Yes, you should honour them. But there are also implications on what about other things here? All right? So we are not saying you can't travel. We are not saying that you can't exercise. You can't do this. But even in those things, think of the biblical principles and what it will affect. Don't plan at the time where you are going to pull your children out of church Organize once a year activity. For example, family, family seminar. It's once a year. It's printed in your calendar. One of the first things that, that, that I wanted to do in this church is produce a calendar because then we have the whole year's activities for you. You can plan your leave. You can plan your travels. Right? We do not want you to miss studying the Word of God, which is what is needed for you to find God's will. So we produce all that. A lot of activities, a lot of planning, a lot of work goes into that every year but you throw it away. Oh, I didn't know. 
right? I was encouraging a parent, say, hey, you know, don't, don't bring your children away during this period. And the, the father just said, oh, is it always at that time? I said, every year is that time. It's a calendar, right? Every year. Um, so every year is a problem, right? So parents, you cannot say, bring my children to holiday. Yes, that, not sin that is not sinful. But there are preceptive will involved. Just examples, okay? Now, next frequently asked question is, wait, hang on. Now, what if I choose to do something out of fear, so someone asks, or wrong motives initially? Does it mean that I am in God's chastative will and need to undo my decision? You understand the question, right? So the person says, well, I chose to do something, but at that point of time, I, maybe my, I was not so mature spiritually, I did it out of, well, I just want to avoid something, want to not suffer certain things. I just did it. Wrong motives. The thing itself is not sinful. But now the person says, well, you know, because it was a wrong motive, then... Am I in chastative will? I'm afraid of that. Sh should I now undo that decision? Now, what do you think? What do you think? Now, it depends. All right? It depends. For example, now we did visit this principle. Now, Moses, Moses, the Bible said, and Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. And he ran away. Right? He feared. He made a choice based on fear. For example. Now, but... We have to realize, sometimes God uses it. It was not God's timing anyway. It was not God's timing for him to do certain things, to realize certain things, all right? God used this event to humble Moses in the land of the Midianites. He went there and he, he was really humble, all right? He, then, now, God could be using his providence to direct you into his will because you were not seeking him at, the, at that stage or unsafe. So, at that stage, you were not seeking God. And you just went ahead to make certain decisions in fear. Now, in the mercy of God, sometimes it is how even in your foolishness, in your foolishness, now He can use that to direct you, direct you. And eventually you realize, oh, this situation, like Moses, he realized that situation humbled him, right? Made him what he needed to be. Now, so it depends. It depends. Um, I'm not saying that it is always the same with everyone because you have the opposite. You have the opposite. Jonah. Well, we studied this example also. Well, God wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh. Sorry about the size difference in the words. Go to Nineveh. N jo Jonah said, well, I don't want to go there. And everything was smooth, right? Everything went well. He, went, he ran away from Nineveh from, with wrong motives. God wanted him to repent. God wanted him to return. He had to return. All right. So, really, it all depends. Then, say, then what is the answer? So what is the answer? Say, depends is not going to help me. All right. Uh, maybe, Michelle, what's the answer? You're smiling. So, what's the answer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be, be honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. You go back to the principles. You go back to the principles because this may be God's way of directing you here or there. At the same time, it also may not be and God wants you to correct what you did because there is a personal will, right? A personal will. So that is God's will for you. You pray. You study the word. You apply the principles. Then you ask God for His directive will very honestly. You be your heart laid out, God, whichever is the case. In fact, my preference is this and that. God, I will be very honest with you. But please overrule all this. I will do your will. Help me, God. Honestly pray to God, all right? With godly sincerity, not fleshly wisdom. Maybe if I, if I went here, I did that. Oh, maybe this is the benefit. Well, I'll use perceptive principle, not fleshly wisdom, all right? God knows, God will know, and God will lead and guide. So, so yes, so that step is always search the whole counsel of God, the principles, apply it to your situation. Don't just take one. Honestly, with godly sincerity, without fleshly wisdom, ask Him to use His Word to direct you. All right? You will know. He will. He's the living God. He will show you. 
Don't skip around in your devotion. Do it consistently. Then you never doubt. This is the other thing I want to say. Christians, please read God's word consistently so that when God speaks to you, you will never wonder, is it because today I happen to read this? But no, I've been reading this consistently and at that time, at that situation, God make it so clear. The directive will is often found like that. Then with that, you submit to God's will, walk in His cooperative will. Then don't look back by faith. Don't look back. Now, if you don't settle these things, whoever is going through this, I'm still not sure, I'm not, still not sure, I'm still struggling. It's a very miserable life and it's a life that you will not be useful to God because you will not be committed. You will not give your 100% because you still wonder, have I sorted out this thing? Am I living in sin or not? You will always struggle, all right? Seek godly counsel, that's the other one. Now, what if I choose to do something... Oh, sorry, here. All right, so there's a, a person who... I've, I've mentioned this already. Seek his preceptive wills, honestly seek his directive will, enter into cooperative will with him. Now, next one. What if I prayed? What if I prayed that God will shut the doors and if it, if it is not his will and he did not shut the door? All right, so very common question, very common with many of us. God, you know, if it is not your will, please shut the door. All right, please make this... Um, not possible, and it won't go ahead. Should you do that? Well, I think the answer is clear. Don't seek confirmation signs as way, as the primary means to determine God's will. Don't depend on circumstances, providence, even ask God to give you peace or no peace of heart. Don't use those as your primary means to find God's will. Now, because... What if God really don't shut the door? Are you going to go ahead with it? Then you keep wondering. Well, maybe. And sometimes people share with me, God, you know, I, I pray for this and then, and I say, well, if God shows you, then why are you not going to do it? But you know, I also have doubt. You see how miserable that life is? But I also have doubt. Maybe I'm going to ask again. All right? So, don't do that. Go to preceptive will and, well, if there's open and shut doors, there's six circumstances. You look back and have them as comforting assurances. Can God's will change for a person? What do you think? All right? So this, again, is a very repeated question. Can God's will change for my life? Can God's will change for my child's life along the way? What do you think? I know all of you will say yes and no, right? Now, yes and no, right? It's yes and no. Depends on what you mean, all right? So people who like to ask this question, depends on what you mean. God's will does change in our life as we go through different stages. Gracia, is God's will for you now, all right, to get married? No, of course not. What is God's will for you now, Gracia, to be a? At your stage, at your age. To go to school, to be a student, right? God's not saying be married now, all right? But God's will may be for you to get married later on in life. So as we go through, if you mean, does God's will change in that sense? Yes, it does. Rather, God's will um, at every stage of your life will be known, all right? Then the next stage of life, His will, His already predetermined will must be found and must be done, okay? So yes, you, no one can say, God's will is for me to be a student. And then you're 80 years old, no, God's will is for me to be a student. Right? Whole life be a student. One of the students look up and say, who wants that? <laughs> now, then next one, for example, marriage. Marriage. Well, at this point, singlehood. But you don't know. If God wants you to get married in that sense, yeah, His will now will move into the marriage will. So, don't ask questions like that um, and think that God's will don't change in that sense. Now, and the danger is this. If we think that, we can grow up like that. Well, from young, from when I was young, I always felt that I want to get married. And God's will is for me to get married. All right? Not knowing what marriage is about. So from young, you did that. And then you say, from young, my parents emphasized that. Then you say, well, God's will doesn't change. Then as, as soon as I grow up, I must get married. Because God's will don't change, right? So when we think God's will doesn't change in that sense... It's dangerous, all right? It's dangerous. And can be the opposite. God wants you to get married and then you want to enjoy the world and you don't want to, all right? So, and so on and so forth. So God's will can change in that sense. Now, what about God's will not changing? It is also unchangeable. Now, for example, marriage. 
Once you enter into marriage, then that is unchangeable. You cannot say, um, you know, pastor taught us that God's will changes. So now I am in my middle age and I have a middle age crisis. A middle age crisis, I like to be like, you know, a playboy, a dry sports car. So I, I, I now need to move into a singlehood stage, right? There are some people who say, well, I think, well, I think God's will changes for me. So now it's, it's time to be a single. Then they get divorced. Because he said God's will change us. So please don't think like that. But full time calling, full time calling is a lifetime call. It's a change. You enter into that, it's a lifetime call. Right? Now, maybe I'll ask you this because this is another one that I, I'm asked almost once or twice every year. Now, what happens? What about our church case? There were people who came in as pastors. They, they studied in Bible colleges. They came in as pastor and all that. Then today, they're not our pastor anymore or they, 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 um, they're no longer even going to church, some of them, right? Went to Bible college and all that, served full-time, not even going to church anymore. But I thought you said God's, God's calling does not change. How do you answer that? Because people ask that. What are people, people who are called, then after that, they are no longer in the ministry? How do you answer that, Richard? They're not called. They're not called. Yes. Now, yes. Now, just because someone says, I am called, doesn't mean it's God's will. Please remember that. Just because someone walk up to you and say, God says you should marry me, doesn't mean it is true, right? So, just because a person says it's called, may not be. So the person can go to Bible college. The person can graduate from Bible college. The person can say he's, your, he's called here. The person can come here and serve for a while. But if the person was not called in the first place, right, has God's will changed? No, God's will never changed. Right? God's will was never for this person to be in the ministry. It was his self-will. And then, has God's will changed? Now he's in the world. Maybe God's will change. Huh? No, he was never called in the first place. So now... He's, he's resuming, hopefully, all right? If he is still walking with the Lord, he's resuming what God intended for him in his life as his will in the first place. Okay, so I hope that clarifies because people often ask that. Now, it can be another situation where can it be that the person is called but is no longer in the ministry, Shane? How? Gone astray, gone astray, love the world, want to go back to the world. Although his calling is genuine, is full-time calling, God did call him. But having loved this present world, they leave the calling. Possible too, right? Some people are called and they choose to leave the ministry. Can be genuinely called as well. But that, right? Or it can be, well, certain people, they commit certain grievous sin. God disqualifies them, can be genuinely called. An example we just studied, Eli, Eli, right? So it can be all this situation. Does God's will change? You have to know what you're asking and you need to think um, clearly, all right? Okay, so, but do remember this. Sometimes God didn't call you to that thing. That is not God's will for you in your life. But in your willfulness, you choose to do it. Choose to be in that line or that situation. Well, don't think that you can always just resume back God's original will for you because some, some are lifetime consequences. For example, if God intends for you to be single, if you get married, and then you find that life is miserable because it's not God's will. You cannot undo that. All right? Now you walk in a very a long life a lifetime of chastity will. Other things can be other consequences. Now, next. Oh, I finished. Okay. All right. Well, there are, there are a whole bunch of other questions that I will answer in our next topic for Adelphos Adelphi. Now, I hope that this gives you um, some overview and go back and visit the slides. And anyone of you who are seeking God's will about something, 
go through that process. One of it is seeking godly counsel, right? So you know my phone number. I'm happy to talk to you to give you counsel from the Word of God. But do not walk into God's chastity will because of all these hindrances. Let us turn to God in prayer. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they're the most readily available results. They stop attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from